peer-reviewed research has literally proven that global index funds are flawed and are not the best way to invest in the stock market for maximum returns as a passive investor. And if this research is right, then the very foundations of low-cost passive investing could be flawed, meaning Vanguard founder Jack Bogle and even Warren Buffett could both be wrong. But before we show you why global index funds aren't so great and what you could invest in instead, we first have to go back in time to show you how I figured this out. Now this is me, two years ago, back when I was learning about, oh crap, we've gone back too far to my stock picking days. You weren't supposed to know this, get it gone. Oh, that's better. Now, I learned about the basics of passive investing just like most of us did, by reading the classics, watching the biggest YouTube channels, and listening to podcasts about investing. It didn't take long for me to figure out the basics, which I talk about on this channel all the time. Investing passively with low-cost global index funds that track the entire global markets is the best way to do it. Most active managers fail to beat the market over long periods of time, and you probably won't have much luck picking your own stocks either. With the odds of beating the market stacking up against you, why try? Just invest in low-cost passive index funds and you'll be just fine. So that's exactly what I I did. I switched off from the markets and I got on with my life. Until the voices started. Your returns are rubbish. How can an index fund be the best? Buy some Bitcoin, bro. Passive investing is for losers. So I sat down, got my laptop out and started doing some digging. No, not that digging. I mean research. The first thing that stood out to me was the CAPM model from the early 1960s, which models the expected return of an investment. A key takeaway is that there is a direct relationship between risk and reward. You take on risk when you invest in the stock market and you should be rewarded for that risk. Market beta is a measure of the volatility of a particular stock or portfolio relative to the market as a whole. The larger the beta, the larger the expected return of an investment. By investing in global index funds, your portfolio essentially becomes the market, meaning that you'd have a market beta of one. So I was happy that the global index funds that I invested in provided plenty of market beta and that I would be rewarded for taking on the risk of investing in the market. But this research was from the 1960s and the research doesn't just suddenly stop there. In fact, there have been many more high profile advancements in economic theory since then. One of the most famous came along in 1992 with a research paper titled The Cross-Section of Expected Stock Returns by Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French. They showed that it wasn't just market risk that could be used to explain the returns of a portfolio. There were actually two other factors at play. The key discoveries were that value stocks tend to outperform growth stocks and small stocks tend to outperform large stocks. Now this seems counterintuitive. Surely the largest companies with the strongest growth prospects are going to perform the best. I mean, just look at Apple, Amazon and Tesla and their success stories over the past few years. But these discoveries were made through analysing years of stock market data and there are two sides to the argument as to why it is actually true. Perhaps a more popular argument relates directly to risk. Value stocks are, by definition, undervalued and of course they are probably undervalued for a good reason. Perhaps they had some poor earnings or maybe their future cash flow prospects are looking bleak. So they are inherently more risky when compared to a growth stock, which has a promising future with wild growth potential. And as we know with investing, risk is directly proportional to reward. So the riskier value stocks have a higher expected return. The same goes for small stocks, which are typically more volatile when compared to large cap stocks because of their looser management structures and less established behaviours. The other side of the argument relates to the behaviour of market participants, rather than the risk associated with the two factors. Perhaps in investors are just incorrectly pricing both small stocks and value stocks, meaning that you can buy them on the cheap, which increases the expected returns of a stock. Either way, the expected returns of a diversified portfolio can be estimated based on its exposure to these three investing risk factors, market, value, and size. In fact, the expected returns of a diversified portfolio can be explained with 95% accuracy. So if an active manager does happen to beat the market with a diversified portfolio, as in not just five or six stocks that happen to do well, then this model can explain 95 95% of that outperformance based on the portfolio's exposure to the value, size, and market risk factors. So you could intentionally build a diversified portfolio that tracks the broad market with an added tilt towards value and small cap stocks. And the academic theory suggests that you will beat the market. So I took a step back looked at the bog standard index fund that I was invested in and I realised a huge problem. Most index funds are market cap weighted, meaning that the largest stocks in the index get the largest allocations. These are the top 10 holdings for VWRL, the FTSE All World ETF, which includes around 3,800 stocks. These top 10 holdings make up 15.1% of the entire index. To make it even worse, value stocks are, by definition, undervalued, which means that they'll have smaller market caps and therefore smaller allocations in market cap weighted indices. This Morningstar style box shows the size and value 
breakdown for VWRL. The index is mostly made up of large companies with a blend between value and growth stocks. So global index funds include the market risk factor, but completely ignore the value and size risk factors, meaning that they are inherently flawed and are literally doomed to provide us with average stock market returns. Passive investors have actually been wrong all along. We thought we were going with the research, but we're almost going against it. I was wrong, Jack Bogle was wrong, and Warren Buffett's advice to invest in the S&P 500 was also wrong. It's fair to say that this left me pretty deflated, but I pulled myself together and started thinking about these risk factors. In theory, you could build a diversified portfolio that concentrates entirely on small cap value stocks and completely ignore large cap growth, which means that you'd have maximum exposure to both the market value and size risk factors and your returns should be gigantic. But this is the key point that you need to understand. They are called risk factors for a reason. They are risky and you can't get rewarded without taking on risk. Value stocks and small cap stocks both behave differently when compared to the broader market, meaning that your returns would not be in sync with a typical global index fund. This graph from Vanguard shows how value stocks have matched up against growth stocks since 1936, and whilst they have dominated for most of history, they have actually been losing out to growth for over 10 years now. This graph shows how small stocks have matched up against large stocks, with small stocks winning when the line drops below this level here. Small stocks have been winning most of the time, but they do go through periods of underperformance too. If you had invested in just value stocks over the past 10 years or so, then the broader market returns would have absolutely smashed yours out of the park. Imagine losing out to a normal index fund for over 10 years. Would you stick with a plan or would you tap out and run back to a global index fund? This is part of a risk that you are taking on when investing in a risk factor tilted portfolio. Yes, over long periods of time you are expected to outperform the market, but you may have to endure long periods of underperformance. So I started to think that factor investing was just for absolute risk seekers, but I realised that it can be more controlled than it first appears. It turns out that the individual risk from the market, value and size risk factors don't just add up to make a super risky portfolio. When you invest in multiple factors, the risks are all independent, meaning that you can actually take on more risk without increasing the overall risk of your portfolio. To help visualise it, I like to think of the risk factors as seasoning, with the market being salt, value being chilli and size being pepper. We want to combine our risk factors to get the best returns possible, just like we want to combine our seasoning to get the best flavours. Our standard global index funds include a load of salt, and whilst that may taste nice, some of us have a more acquired taste. But it comes with a catch. If you chuck too much chilli powder in, then it could taste nice depending on who you are, but not everybody is going to be a fan. Just like if you put too much value in your portfolio. Yes, it could work out with potentially higher returns, but you're going to be adding a lot of value risk, which includes the chances of years of underperformance. It's all about finding a balance, one that works for you and one that isn't too overpowering. If you do find a balance between all three spices, then you could be onto something special. But different people have different tastes, just like different investors have different risk tolerances. There is no one portfolio suits all. I finally felt that I had cracked a problem, but I kept researching because more advancements had been made. I didn't like what I found. Farmer and French went on to release a five-factor model, which now includes the profitability and investment risk factors. In fact, hundreds of papers have been released and there are arguments for hundreds of risk factors. How am I supposed to keep up with this? I couldn't take it anymore. And here I am today, still investing in my standard global index funds, but I know that there are potentially better options out there for passive investors like me. So it begs the question, why don't more of us listen to the research and keep up with the times? Why do we settle for standard global index funds, which have exposure to the market risk factor, but not the other two. Well, even if we wanted to, the number of accessible investing products that offer quality factor funds are actually quite limited. iShares have some of the best products on offer, but the funds either have high ongoing charges or a low number of stocks which limits diversification. There is a company known as Dimensional Fund Advisors that offer an elite range of factor funds. Farmer and French are actually directors there, but their funds are only accessible through financial advisors, which is a barrier for some people. I also think that factor investing feels like an uncomfortable thought for many people. Beating the market feels like it shouldn't be possible and if you try to do it, then you feel like an active investor. You have to decide yourself where to draw the line between passive and active, and whether or not you want to take on the added risk and variability that comes with factor investing. This graph shows how some different factors performed from 1988 through to 2013, with this blue line here showing the normal market. Some factors underperformed even over 25 years, while some factors smashed it out of the park. It's interesting to see how each factor follows an independent path, proving that all of the risks are actually independent and that a blend of different factors could complement each other well. So the information is there to be seen and you can try to implement it for yourself if you really want to, but as a passive investor, it's probably going to feel weird with all of the added effort that you're going to have to put in. Just like when you're cooking, you can take your time to balance the spices and make a masterpiece that tastes divine. But for most of us, settling for some beans on toast with a little salt.
will get the job done. If you do want to get the best returns as a passive investor, then investing in factors isn't going to be enough on its own. You also need to know how to react when your investing portfolio is in the red so that you can get the maximum returns possible. And that's why you need to watch this video here, which includes some information that could save you tens of thousands of pounds in the long run.